We're going to study the epistles of John. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is the normal order. That, that, that's the order that in your Bible. We're going to take them up in the inverse order. We're going to take the two little short ones first, that's 3rd and 2nd, and leave 1st John to the big climax. But um, whenever we go into the Word of God, we want to open with a word of prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Word. We pray, Father, you'd write it on our hearts. We do pray, Father, that you'd open our hearts and lives to your Word, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, our coming King, in whose name we commit this evening and ourselves. Amen. The Epistles of John. Okay. And, uh, you know, the early church in the first century was under attack both from the inside and the outside. And you say, well, <laughs> so what's changed, right? That's exactly what's going on today, isn't it? So you'll find that this is surprisingly relevant. It should not surprise us that the Holy Spirit has anticipated every conceivable form of attack and diversion. And these three epistles that we're going to explore are full of insights that are timely for each of us right now at the individual personal level as well as a collective or corporate uh, level. And so, first of all, who was John? Well, he was the brother of James the Greater, huh? And uh, he was probably the younger of the sons of Zebedee and Salome his mother, and was born, not the, not the Salome you're thinking of, different Salome, but anyway, and was born in Bethsaida. And uh, his father apparently was a man of some wealth, we infer, from a number of allusions. Uh, John was doubtlessly trained in all that constituted the normal education of a Jewish youth. And when he grew up, his, he followed the occupation of a fisherman with his family on the Sea of Galilee. And don't regard that as some kind of menial occupation. They had partners, multiple boats. It was quite a business that uh, the, they were in. And uh, so that, that'll h impact as you, as you study their lives. When John the Baptist, different John now, when John the Baptist began his ministry in the wilderness of Judea, John with many others gathered around him and was deeply influenced by his teaching, which, which was, of course, a call to repentance. And that's where they heard the announcement, Behold the Lamb of God. And John the Baptist introduced Jesus by that title, twice. And uh, that's a very Jewish title. It's alluding to the Passover. Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, and uh, so on the uh, invitation of Jesus, John became a disciple and ranked among his followers for a time. He and his brother then probably returned to their former avocation, but we don't know for how long. Jesus again called them, and now they left all and permanently joined the company of his disciples, actually traveled with them little different thing than just being a believer. They left their businesses, their uh, uh, commitments, and joined the, the disciples. To become, incidentally, John became one of the three insiders. For their zeal and intensity of character, Jesus gave them a nickname. He and his brother were called Boanerges, which is Sons of Thunder. You know, it's very funny to me. I always I remember as a kid even, I'd see these Sunday school uh, film strips and stuff. You always see John portrayed sort of effeminately, sort of passively, sort of, you know, uh, for a number of reasons, I guess. But it's interesting, that's just contrary to the scriptural. His nickname was Son of, Th Son of Thunder. These guys, he and his brother, were <laughs> rowdies, I assume, right? And uh, anyway, this spirit of chutzpah broke out on a number of occasions in, in the uh, Gospels, in uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke, of course. They show up there rather than the Gospel of John for a number of reasons. But uh, he had insider status. He became one of the innermost circle. There were three of that. They were the only ones available at the raising of Jairus' daughter. They were the three that were present at the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. And uh, at Gethsemane, they were closer in, inner circle. And of course, in Mark 13, there are four. There are three of the four that were given the inside briefing, which we call the Olivet Discourse. Peter, James, and John, and also Peter's brother Andrew was with them. And so um, he he's also was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And uh, he refers to him, rather than name himself, he just describes himself sort of in a third person uh, posture uh, in, in his narrative in John, especially in those final chapters, 19, 20, and 21. In that final week uh, of Christ's uh, ministry, at the betrayal, he and Peter followed Christ afar off, while the others betook themselves hasty flight. The rest of them split, but Peter and John hung in there. 
and uh, uh, at the trial. He followed Christ into the council chamber. He had access somehow, and thence to the praetorium, and then from there to the very place of crucifixion. So John had access for some reason. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was consigned to John's care at the cross. This is going to be turned. This is going to turn out to be very relevant to us when we get to the next epistle. To understand that Jesus consigned the care of his mother not to any of his three brothers, but to John the Apostle. And uh, that's going to be relevant to our discussions in our next session. But uh, we'll talk about that then. To John and Peter, Mary first conveyed, the, this is now Mary Magdalene, conveyed the uh, tidings of the resurrection, and they were the first to go and see what her strange words meant in John 20. After the resurrection, he and Peter again returned to the Sea of Galilee, where the Lord revealed himself to them. And all we know is that John can run faster than Peter. Huh. But anyway, that's another. We find that Peter and John frequently uh, are together after this. They were really, they were insiders together. They also were had shared many of these experiences together. In the later years, John remained apparently in Jerusalem among the leadership because we see him at the council, of course, in Acts 15, and uh, he's so alluded to in Galatians 2, Paul's epistle. And he apparently was not there, however, at the time of Paul's last visit. We infer that from Acts 21. His subsequent history is unrecorded. We don't know literally how, what happened after that in detail. He appears to have returned to Ephesus, but exactly at what time is unknown. He, his, these three epistles were probably written by him from Ephesus. And... Uh, he suffered under persecution and was, of course, banished to Patmos. Most of us are aware of that. And where he again returned, after that, he returned to Ephesus where he finally died. And so uh, there is some confusion as to when he wrote which. Most of us assume he wrote his gospel earlier, because in the Bible we encounter his gospel, and Revelation's at the end, and the epistles in the middle. There is some extra biblical evidence that, well, uh, it, by the way, this, this was he, he, that probably about 98 A.D., having outlived near, uh, most, if not all, his uh, companions. Uh, and, uh, so uh, there's some extra biblical evidence that he may have written the gospel after his Patmos experience. I was rapping with uh, my friend Hal Lindsey, and, uh, who's, uh, uh, and he, he may, he's, he's caught, uh, come to the inference that the gospel was written after the Patmos experience. And when I pressed him on that, he, uh, there's a number of clues, he feels, in the text, but primarily he also has encountered some extra-biblical extra evidence that seems to suggest that. It appeals to me because in the book of Revelation, we're very conscious of the heptatic structure, the seven, this, seven, 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 seven. It's very conspicuous in the architecture of the book of Revelation. That same architecture is in the gospel, but very subtly. You have to watch for it. But uh, that's another whole study. There are many interesting traditions about John's residence at Ephesus, but we can't claim these have the character of historical fact. One of those colorful traditions is that they tried to boil them in oil and it didn't work. And you, you, there are all these quaint this, traditions in the early church about John. And uh, we can smile at those, but I think we should treat them with great caution because there's no reliable uh, substantiation of some of those colorful traditions. Ephesus, of course, is one of those must-visit places because the ruins there are phenomenal. It's surprisingly intact. Um, and, of course, it's a scene of so much history with Paul, of course, and, uh, and of course, John, and so forth. So and then you're planning your trips. You get a chance. You don't want to miss Ephesus. Some of the other of the church, seven church Romans are, are pretty rough, and uh, it's, it, it's a... But sometimes you say it's a you know, long run for a short slide uh, kind of thing. But uh, this is really worth it. Now, the writings of John, of course, he wrote five books of the New Testament. His Gospel, of course, the book of Revelation, and the three epistles. And most uh, scholars assume that the epistles are written last, just before the close of the first century. The distinctive of his Gospel he, uh, is that it's an epistle in which his purpose is declared. Matthew is a scribe. He tries to just be diligent and record history. But John is writing an editorial an op-ed piece, as we might call it, because his purpose is declared. Many other things that Jesus, the presence of the disciples, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So he's unabashedly argumentative. 
And he does that in his epistle seven times. We'll encounter that when we get to what's called uh, 1 John. His sevenfold structure is very evident in the gospel. And I won't go into that here. We can you get that. If you study or learn the Bible in 24 hours, we highlight that there. And of course, uh, in our uh, uh, first by verse study of John. Of the book of Revelation, the heptatic structure is not only evident, it's dominant. So that uh, uh, the fact that the gospel may have been written after the book of Revelation is an appealing idea. There's an interesting thing, though, I'd like you to notice. You know, I'm always fascinated by those evidences that the Bible as a whole, the 66 books, were very explicitly designed supernaturally. And there's all kinds of that. It's interesting to me, me to see the consistency of designations. The friend of God, that's a term used of Abraham in James 2 and 2 Chronicles and Isaiah, several places in the Old Testament. And, and it all derives from an incident in Genesis 18 where God says about Abraham, shall I hide from him what I'm about to do? Abraham is called the friend of God. It's one of his titles. Why? Because God reveals to him what he's about to do. The concept of being a friend, friendship is associated with letting him in on what's coming. In, in, God's, in, 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 the, in the text here. Well, when you get to the disciples, Jesus says, now, Before you were my servants, now you are my friends. And that's in the upper room from John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. The, those whole passages there are where Jesus, because they're his friends, he lets them in on what's coming. That's where the rapture is first talked about in John 14 and so forth. So the friend of God seems to be associated in the Scripture with letting you in on the inside, okay? Well, another term in the Scripture is beloved, okay? And there is a one of the Old Testament people that has the title of being God's beloved. Who is it? Daniel. Very good. And Daniel, of course, is the beloved prophet, but he also is the one that's been given the benefit of what we would call apocalyptic visions, the visions of Daniel from chapter 7 to 12. The last half of the book is these apocalyptic visions. And many of them are conspicuously interlinked with the passage in the book of Revelation. The word beloved. Who is the beloved disciple? John. And who wrote the apocalypse of the New Testament? John. It fascinates me to notice that the friendship carries with it a consistency, and the concept of beloved has an aspect of consistency. Yeah, I thought I'd point that out. But uh, the Gospel of John has a number of distinctives. The book of Revelation has its heptatic structure. And the disciples, of the epistles of John, there are three. The third one is to Gaius. The second one is to someone called the elect lady. And we'll leave that mystery for next time. And 1 John is to the church at large. And many people regard 1 John, many scholars do, as not an epistle in the usual sense. It actually seems to be a sermon. It's a organized uh, uh, articulation to the church at large. It probably did take the form of a letter to one or several of the churches, but it is a little, it, it has its own distinctive character. And I've chosen to go at these inversely. Uh, get the small ones first as sort of a warm up and leave the first John, which is really the core thing, finally. So we're going to tackle tonight a little introduction and then we'll get into uh, the third ep the epistle of John, which is a little shorty. So uh, in retrospect, Matthew, he, he focused on the promised one. He sees his credentials. Ma Mark was really the amanuensis for Peter, we believe, and it, just, it focuses on how he worked. He sees his power. And Luke, this is what he was like, because he's a doctor, his, his nature. He was interested in this, that he was human. John focused on who he really was, his godship, if you will. So the, each of the four Gospels are quite distinctive. And it might be useful to refresh our perspective of that before we jump into John's letters. Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah. He's Jewish, the Messiah, the, the coming king. Mark deals with his as a servant, the suffering servant. Luke, the son, being a doctor, the son of man. And John, the son of God. So it's interesting that in genealogies, Matthew has a Jewish genealogy. It starts with the first Jew, if I can put it that way, called Abraham. And he has the legal... Uh, uh, genealogy of Jesus Christ. Mark, his focus is as a servant, and we don't care about the pedigree of a servant, so it's the only one of the four that does not have a genealogy. Luke, 
since he's interested in his humanity, if you will, he starts his genealogy with Adam. When you, from Adam to Abraham, I mean, uh, 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 it's distinctive. From Abraham to David, they're both identical. But from David on, Luke takes a different path than Matthew does. Matthew goes through the legal line through Solomon. Luke goes through the bloodline of Mary, in effect. Now, John has a genealogy, but most people don't recognize it. It's the genealogy of the pre-existent ones, the first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And uh, in that whole, in analyzing that, that's really, in effect, the genealogy of the pre-existent one. But Matthew focused on what Jesus said, Mark, and what he actually did, and Luke, what he felt. You see his passion in there. And John, who he was. And uh, that's why I'm always so intrigued by Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. It's a great movie, but it's sort of, in a sense, it's sort of like Luke. You feel the passion, but he doesn't do what John does, and that's describe who he really is, the Creator incarnate, entering his creation to execute a program for our behalf. So Matthew wrote to the Jew, Mark to the Roman, Luke to the Greek, John to the church. And uh, the first miracle in Matthew, of course, was a leper cleanse. The Jew, that, that's a very Jewish kind of a thing. Both Mark and Luke, since they're both Gentiles, a demon expelled is the first thing in both of those. John has a very different perspective. It's the water to wine. And we even find a hint there of the church issues in terms of communion and all of that. Uh, Matthew ends with the resurrection. Mark goes one step further. He goes to the ascension. Luke goes one step further yet, the promise of the Spirit. Why? Because he's setting up the stage for his sequel, Luke Volume 2, called the Book of Acts. John, the promise of his return. And that, of course, sets the stage for his sequel, so to speak, the Book of Revelation. So, and we have uh, where they camped on each of them. I won't get all that here. And the ensign of the tribes on the four sides of the camp of Israel which had as symbols the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And it's been noticed even in the early church, they noticed that those four faces of the cherubim as represented in the ensigns of the four camps are also the four labels of the uh, 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 four Gospels. Matthew being the, representing as the lion of the tribe of Judah, Mark being servants, and the classical idiom of service was the ox, the strength of the ox, Luke, man, of course, and John the eagle. And uh, so... So for what it's worth. And it's also a little different now. But anyway, so that's, that's the perspective of John. John is really focusing on a, on a very high plane here in his materials. The Gospel of John is a very unusual Gospel because it's one that a beginner can read and gain something from. It's also the most advanced theologian in the world can go through it and find, make, continue to make new discoveries. They often say it's, it's uh, accessible enough for a child to wade in but deep enough for an elephant to to wash. So. Okay, enough of that. The Epistles of John, first, second, and third. But we're going to start with the easy one first. Okay, third John. It's it, it's the shortest one in the Greek, and it's written for the purpose of commending to Gaius some Christians who were strangers in the place where he lived and who had gone thither for the purpose of preaching the gospel. So this is sort of a tutorial for his friend Gaius. The second and third epistles were probably written soon after the uh, first, from all these probably from Ephesus. One of the key words in this will be testified, report, bear record, record. Um, these are all uh, uh, witness terms, and we'll be sensitive to that as we go. They're not just words, but by the life that's led. Every Christian is a, is a witness, either a good one or a bad one. We're either helping the truth or hindering it. And we're either part of the solution or part of the problem, in other words, okay? So, third epistle of John. Gaius is the encourager from verses 2 through 8. It's going to be a, talk about a, 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 a service and love. The second one will be Diotrophenes, which is the dictator. And there's five indictments laid on him. He's bad news. And then Demetrius, he's the exemplar. He's the good example. He's the good guy. And each of us has the opportunity be part of the solution or part of the problem? I won't ask for a show of hands. Okay. But guys, the encourager. Verse 1, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. By the way, right now, before I prejudice your view, what does that mean? When John says, whom I love in the truth. What's he talking about? 
the veracity of facts in general? What does he mean by the truth? What, what, I love in the truth. What is he probably alluding to? Being a, very good. You, yes, Christ. It's equivalent to the way we might say, love you in Christ, in the truth. He's using the truth here, I believe, as a title of Jesus Christ. That's not important here. It's pretty, it doesn't disrupt our flow here, but it may be very important for us to understand John's style here. Anyway, the elder. Presbyteros. What does it mean? It's an elder of age, elder of two people, an elder of senior. It's also, though, a term of rank or office, and it's so used typically in the church. The New Testament uses the term bishop, elders, and presbyters interchangeably. Some people try to make, you know, hair, uh, d distinctions between these three, but there's some evidence that they're really, in effect, for our purposes certainly, uh, interchangeable terms. And uh, we even find 24 elders seated on the thrones around the throne of God in, in Revelation 4, which is a very critical area to really understand. The, now, this is the third epistle of John. It's addressed to Caius or Gaius, and, uh, it's, and, but whether to the Christian uh, 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 by that name in Macedonia or in Corinth or in Derby, There are three Gaiuses in the Bible, in Macedonia, Corinth, and Derby, in different places. Which one is the focus of the letter is a subject of speculation. We don't know. I'm sorry I can't give you some fringe discovery to give you a bias there, but I'm sure you've got more important things to focus on. Uh, we, the truth of the matter is uh, com the commentary community is uncertain as to which one it might be. But he continues, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Interesting. First of all, John loved this man. Beloved occurs four times in this little note. Four times. And we know from this that he was sound in doctrine. That's refreshing. But I want you to notice the inversion. May your physical health be as sound as your spiritual health. That's pretty cool, I think. You know, that's, that's, that in itself is a, an interesting accolade just tucked away inside there. You see, I, I uh, hope you prosper and be in health as, as your soul is prospering. That's a, there's an inversion there that I think is, is colorful. In physical health, you know, we can identify a number of factors. Nutrition, exercise, cleanliness, proper rest, and the discipline of a balanced life. Any surprises there? This pretty much is a, you know, a five-step program to, uh, you could elaborate on. Your spiritual health, same group. Nourishment, the Word of God. That's what, did, what digestion is to the body, meditation is to the soul. Wow. Exercise, a godly workout. Guys read it, meditated on it, delighted in it, and then practiced it daily, we learn. Cleanliness, what does that mean? Avoiding con the contamination and pollution of the world. That's tough in our world, isn't it? It was tough in theirs. But admittedly, technology has enhanced the pressures of the world on each of us. Rest in the Lord, fellowship with Him, and finally, a discipline of a balanced life. And each one of these has verses you can dig out of the notes, and I encourage you to develop a program for yourself from the Word of God in terms of your spiritual health. We'll resist the temptation to, to belabor the obvious here. The verses are, will be in your notes for what it's worth. But he continues, verse 3, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Would that we each would have a reputation precede us like that. As thou walkest in the truth. Compare that to the first three verses of the book of Psalms. Blessed is the man that walketh uprightly, and so on. Be a doer, not just a hearer. That's why we have three legs in the stool of the Institute. Berean, verse by verse, the study of the Bible. The Issachar leg, the study, understanding the times. But the third one, the Koinos track, the practical doing of whatever you've been called to. True living comes from living truth. Verse 4, I have no greater joy. This is John. Get, get a, a, a glimpse of John's heart here. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Boy, that's a pastor speaking, isn't it? That's a shepherd speaking. He cared for all of them that, thy, that my children walk in truth. All of them. This is follow-up from the heart. But John had a pastor's heart. Verse 5 and 6, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, 
which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Deeds, not just words, is the call here. Sounds like James 2, and it's going to and it's going to echo further in the, uh, as we go on here. After a godly sort, worthy of God as befits God, we're never more godlike than we when we are sacrificing to serve others. The real joys in life are serving others, but when that service becomes sacrificial, that is when we really are bearing testimony after a godly sort. You know, Second John, the one we're going to get next time, warns against showing hospitality to false teachers. If you wish them Godspeed, you are a partaker of their deeds, it says. Here, the assumption is that intimate hospitality is restricted to believers. In chapter 2, uh, uh, excuse me, the second epistle, it's going to be even more restrictive, and that should be a clue to what that Epist who that epistle is really all about. But we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Verse 7 here. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. In other words, never soliciting help from the unsaved is what is the thought here. It isn't that they're non-Jewish. The implication is that they're non uh, uh, you know, uh, unbelievers. Abraham had this same policy in Genesis 14. And uh, not uniformly, but he sure did there. You know, this leads to a t comment on donation policy. A need is not in itself sufficient qualification for a donation. Be sure that the Lord is in it. Be wary of those generally soliciting from all that come, from all that come their way. There are many ministries the Lord would probably shut down if the gullible would let him. But anyway, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. We have to receive such. Hospitality is not only an opportunity, it's also an obligation. Those who receive spiritual blessings from the ministry of the Word ought to share material blessings. You pay your board where you get your food, they say. Okay. Fellow helpers. We know that Gaius's gift, we, we know not what his gifts were, but we know that he was committed to assist. That's what the, the, the term reveals to us there. Now, if John did write these letters after the Patmos vision, that makes up the book of Revelation, then these are his swan song. It's possible these might be the final, his final message uh, you know, to his believers. And uh, we often want to ask ourselves, were all the prominent men in the early church exemplary? No, apparently not. We're going to now encounter a negative example. Okay. Theophrophes, or however you pronounce that, the dictator. And we're going to find that he has five specific indictments leveled against him. Verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but not Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, and receiveth us not. you got a couple of issues right there. And uh, he loves to have preeminence among them. And uh, you know, it's interesting, if I asked you who was Mr. Arrogance on the, on the radio? Most of you could quickly fill in the blank of that, because that's, that's somewhat his image. But in this case, this particular one, receiveth this not. So, okay, what is this all about? Hospitality was a key commitment among the early church. You know, we think travel's tough today. We just got back from a church survey at a conference and having to connect flights, and you come back exhausted. But <laughs> in those days, they didn't have TSA. They didn't have, uh, you know, airline check-in problems. We think we have a tough time. They did. They went on foot. They went on foot. And Peter also emphasizes this issue of hospitality in his letter, as does Paul in his, in Timothy, Romans, and Titus, and so on. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church." This guy's a first-class troublemaker, isn't he? John says, Wherefore, if I come, I'll remember his deeds, which he doeth. And then he goes on to list them, okay? Prattling, prattling against us with malicious words. That's the one that bothers me the most about this. 
What a tragedy that there's so much slander and defamation within the body of Christ. That's been one of the toughest adjustments that I've made going from the secular boardrooms. I spent 30 years in, in, in the boardrooms. Now I look back and realize I had the benefit of, uh, of dealing, uh, being involved with some really first-class people. May not have been believers, don't be sorry, but they were quality people. My biggest adjustment in getting into full-time ministry has been dealing is to deal with these shoddy ethics uh, within the community, the deceit and the uh, slander, and uh, it's just uh, uh, the the toughest part of the last couple last twenty years. I've just been doing the you know full-time part of this. I was thirty years in the boardrooms, then about twenty years in, in in you know doing what we're doing here. But uh, anyway, we'll talk a little more about this before we go. Contention is the evidence of pride. People say, Chuck, will you, will you enter into a debate on pre-trip, post-trip? No. Somebody wants to talk about it, just wants some serious understanding of why we hold those views, great. But I don't believe in debates, not for these kinds of things. Why? Because that, that's a pride issue. Where there's contention, there's pride. And I, I, that, that to me sounds dangerous. We've got to be cautious about accepting what we hear about God's servants. We've got to be, be very cautious. And uh, we hear, we, uh, of, every, of every conflict, you know there's a major side you have not heard. So we should give that great respect, the part we haven't heard. The disturbingly frequent occurrence of gossip, and even worse than that, public slander among Christians is one of the most astonishing paradoxes that I've encountered in the decade of professional Christianity that succeeded my three decades of an executive career in the secular world. And I've included some notes on this most hurtful sin in addendum to the study when we finish here. But you should also recognize there's a fatal disparity between rejecting doctrine and false teaching and the rejection of the brethren with whom we may have a div divergent view. That's the other side of this tension we we're talking about. And uh, so th this fatal disparity between rejecting doctrine and false teaching and the rejection of the brethren this indicates an insecurity. God was a threat to Diophantine's uh, station. He certainly wouldn't be looking forward to John's threatened visit, I'm sure. This also indicates that Jesus wasn't preeminent in his life. That, that, that we know a lot about him by these actions, the, the, this errant member. But we do need to be diligent to have no fellowship with apostates, as we reviewed in our Second Peter study and Jude studies. And we should refrain from entangling alliances with unbelievers, we learn in 2 Corinthians 6. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. See, they that do evil can include pulpits, authors, and TV and radio commentators. If they're not on the mark, they can be promoting misunderstandings, deviant views. We need to understand the dangers there. We should also avoid those whose doctrinal position is contrary to Scripture. That was one of the, that was the part of the good news of the, ch the church at Ephesus when Jesus wrote the letter to Ephesus. They were strict on doctrine. Now they had some problems, lack of devotion, some other things, but they 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 did hold to this well. They they reflected Paul's instructions to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. Now, John's other two epistles are going to stress this same point, one of them in a very surprising way, but I'll leave that for the time when it comes up. There are five indictments. If you go through the verse I just read, there are five indictments leveled about. He must occupy the leading position in the church, apparently is his view. He wants to be preeminent. He actually refused to receive the Apostle John. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? In fact, I uh, had an interesting question posed to me. My wife and I have just finished a book called The Kingdom of the Power and the Glory, which is really quite a, uh, it's really addressed to the church of Laodicea, assuming that it's indicative of our day. And, uh, but somebody, and, and, and a number of pastors have been, not a number, a few, have uh, been quite uh, stressed over our book. And, uh, uh, but one of, the, one of our defenders wrote and said, what do you suppose was the reaction 
of the pastor of the church at Laodicea when he received the package from John, from Patmos. And that's a speculation. We don't know what happened. Someone says, yeah, we probably convened a council to excommunicate John. <laughs> but that's sort of the flavor we've got here. Third, he made malicious statements against the apostles. He refused to extend hospitality to the missionaries. And finally, he excommunicated those who did not receive, excuse me, who did receive the missionaries. He not only refused hospitality, he excommunicated those who did receive. The one of these that bothers me the most is number three. He made malicious statements against the apostles. And I'm going to come back to that one before we're through today. You, got, you know anybody like this, by the way, in our day to day? People are self opinionated, self exalting, rather than self effacing. Self made, self sufficient, self willed, self satisfied, self confident. Do you know any like that? In a word, they're in the flesh. It's not in the spirit. Now, he ostensibly was uh, the first exalted ruler of the church. When he dies, wisdom will die with him, it would seem. And I'm being facetious here. You know, such can wreck a church. And also, don't overlook the presence of Mrs. Diotrephes, too. Even among the disciples there were excessive aspirations. We see that in Matthew 18, in contrast to Phili the, the kenosis of Philippians 2 and so on. And we could go on and on about that one. Preeminence is not for the pastor. The preeminence is reserved for our King, Jesus Christ Himself. That's what Colossians 1.18 is all about, and so on. And uh, even John the Baptist said it so well. He must increase, I must decrease. That's the spiritual position. And by the way, the Greek verb here is in the present tense, active voice. It indicates that this was a constant attitude to promote himself. It wasn't an incident, it was his style. There's a plaque that hangs in, my wife, in the lobby of my wife's ministry that I think is terrific. It's attributed to Augustine. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, agape, love. Boy, good advice. Okay, third, the third uh, epistle of John, now we take the third guy, Demetrius. Now he's the exemplar. And he gets a commendation, of course. Verse 12. Demetrius hath a good report of all men. And, you know, that in itself is staggering. He had a good report of all men. That's pretty cool. Everyone has their boosters. No, this one has a good report of all men. And of the truth itself. Now again, I believe that, that John has a style here of using that as a title of Christ. In fact, if, it should, probably should be capitalized. But anyway. Yea, and we also bear record... And ye know that our record is true. In other words, he has a report of all men, but those all men include me, is what he's saying. Here is an exemplar, an example worthy to be imitated. You know, one of the tragedies of our life today is the lack of role models. You know, it's interesting that uh, I remember as a kid growing up, you had all kinds of role models. They may not really have been that good of guys, but you at least had people you tried to emulate. It's hard to find any today outside maybe the sport world. You certainly don't find in politics um, and, and a lot of other places. But uh, lack of role models. That's what we're called to be. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, there's a converse view here, though. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So out of Luke here, we get a little echo saying, be careful. If everybody's speaking well of you, that may be because you've compromised all the right people, right? So maybe you're compromising or you're masquerading. So that's sort of the cautionary tone, the, re the, the converse we get from Luke. Gaius and Demetrius walked in truth and obeyed the Word of God. They certainly weren't perfect, but they had consistent lives seeking to honor the Lord. Devoutly to be wished, huh? And John continues, I, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. He's going to use email. No, of course not. In fact, even e email doesn't, isn't the same as face to face. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak. Actually, the Greek says mouth to mouth, but our equivalent phrase in our language would be face to face. 
Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. And uh, interesting, uh, George Morrison of Glasgow is famous for making the remark, peace is the possession of adequate resources. Well, the believer has peace because he, is, he has his adequate resources in Jesus Christ. And uh, so it's... Uh, now I want you to no uh, uh, notice something here. Do you notice something that's not said here in closing this letter? If it was written by Paul, what it, would it say? Grace and peace be to you all. That's a code word that Paul uses to close his epistles. Interesting thing. None of the others use that term. Okay. But what a blessing it is to have Christian friends. That's the other echo that comes out of this. When Paul arrived near Rome, some of his brethren went out to meet him. And it says, when whom, Paul, when, who, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Paul finished this hazardous journey. He's on his way to Rome. What a joy it is when he's greeted with the brethren. We experience that too. We'll be called to uh, speak at a conference and so forth. And how delightful it is when there's a group that has met the airplane. We don't need them. There's baggage and whatever, but still. But what a joy it is to be met, to be greeted. And that's, it makes it very special. Well, in the next session, uh, we're gonna, this letter was personal to the individual about problems from inside the church. The next letter, 2 John, was again to an individual, and it's also about false teachers from the outside. This one was about problems from the inside. The other one's going to be from problems from the outside, who would appeal to love so that they might deny the truth. I want to talk about, I want, this is an addenda to this, but I think we can squeeze it in, the most painful sin. As many of you know, we've gone through, Nan and I have gone through some dark times. And, uh, but some of the most painful part of those dark times wasn't the bankruptcy that we went through many years ago. Uh, it wasn't uh, a lot of other things we had to point to, with the earthquakes and what have you. The most pain we endured came from what turned out to be false friends. And that, that was a shock. People we'd known for 20 years that suddenly treated us, us as if we had leprosy because we were on the front pages of the financial section of the local paper. And uh, um, it was as if, we, as if we'd committed some kind of unforgettable sin. Unforgivable sin. There were some that wouldn't even take time to pray with us. And uh, that era was a very sober. Now, the good news is there were strangers we never met that rallied around us with an enthusiasm that was precious. Guys I didn't even met, but they chose to, it turned out some very prominent people assembled uh, themselves as sort of an advisory board for us. But the question then really is what sin has probably caused more pain? than any other. More pain. No murder. No, sometimes the murders are painless, except for maybe the loved ones of the guy that was killed. Not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not minimizing that. But just collectively speaking, what sin has probably caused more pain than any other? Leviticus 19 spells it out, starting at verse 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt not in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Exodus 20, verse 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That's not just a question of lying, saying something's untrue. It's speaking of something untrue about a neighbor. See, my premise is that the most painful sin is gossip. That's caused more pain collectively than anything else you can imagine. Proverbs 10, starting verse 17. He is in the way of life that keepeth instruction, but he that refuseth reproof erreth it. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. Gossip is a form of betrayal. Gossip is probably accountable for more personal pain and suffering than most of us have any appreciation of. Common, casual, yet hurtful beyond our imagining. 
quietly behind the flurry of daily priorities. Its venom does its silent work, undermining confidences, betraying relationships, spreading unseen injustices. It's disturbing to note how many of us have been injured deeply by gossip and by those who accept without checking negative or derogatory innuendos whispered behind our backs. Ooh. What an opportunity to display loyalty, love, and by assuming the most charitable construction in advance, demonstrate the foundation of a relationship. And I like that, especially in advance. The tongue is a ready and willing instrument to talk about our neighbor behind his back. We learn from Romans, 2 Corinthians 12, James 4, and so on. 2 Corinthians 12, 20, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. Lest there be debates and envyings and wraths and strifes and backbitings, whisperings, swelling, tumults. And on he goes, 2 Corinthians, Paul. Back to Proverbs 11:13. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Concealeth the matter. Proverbs 18:8. 18, 8, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Those aren't surface scratches, are they? He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets, therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Where no wood is, there the fire goes out. Where there's no tailbearer, the strife ceases. As coals are to burning coals and wood to the fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a tailbearer are his wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Another repeat of that one. John 8. This they said, tempting him that they might accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued to ask him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, I love this, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And of course they all quietly, they all realized they had other appointments elsewhere. What is a true friend? One who doesn't require explanations. That's a true friend. One who gives the benefit of the doubt. One who is loyal and shuns any form of betrayal. I love this poem. I've just included it as an appendix here by Barbara Young. It's, she calls it, I Hear It Said. Last night, my friend, he says he's my friend, came in and questioned me. I hear it said that you've done this and that. I come to ask, are these things true? A glint was in his eye of small distrust. His words were crisp and hot. He measured me with anger and flung down a little heap of facts that had come to him. I hear it said that you've done this and that. Suppose I have. And are you not my friend? And are you not my friend enough to say, if it were true, there'd be reason in it? And if I cannot know the how and why, still I can trust you, waiting for a word, or if no word, if no word ever come. Is friendship just a thing of afternoons? A pleasure in one's friend and one's dear self? Greed for a sedate approval of his pace? Suspicion if he take one little turn upon the road, one flight into the air, and has not sought you for a yea or nay? No. Friendship is not so. I am my own. And howsoever near my friend may draw unto my soul, there is a legend hung over a certain straight and narrow way, which says, Dear friend, ye may not enter here. I would the time has come, and it is not. When men shall rise and say, He is my friend. He has done this. What is that to me? Think you I have a check upon his head, or cast a guiding rein across his neck? I am his friend. And for that cause I walk not over close beside him, leaving still space for his silences and space for mine. Okay, well, next session, I want for that I want you to study Second John. And you might also take a look. The question is going to occur is who is it addressed to? And I'm astounded to discover 
that the view that I hold, I can't find any commentators that agree with me. Okay? Now, there are two theories. One is that this is a, an idiom of the church. The other view is that it's some prominent person in the Ephesian congregation, but we'll never know who it is. Those two views were proposed by Jerome way back in the, what, the first century or whatever, and is echoed by virtually every commentator I consult. Well, it's one of those two things. Now, most commentators recognize that it's not satisfactory as a term for the church, because we're not children of the church. We're the children of God. I mean, the, you know, the, 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 trying to make the elect lady mother church somehow may have been fine for Jerome, but not we're out, not with our understanding. But I'm going to suggest to you that you can clearly see who it is if you study the text very carefully. And we're going to do that next time. And to pre preparation that, you might want to read John 19, especially verses 25 through 27, because we'll be drawing on some hidden insights regarding that next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for who you are, and we thank you for the examples you've brought to our attention by the writing of our friend John. We do pray, Father, that you'd help us take these to heart, help us to be diligent on doctrine on the one hand, but very gentle and loving in terms of our brethren in the, in, in the fellowship. And Father, we also would pray that you would help us be vastly more circumspect concerning our stewardship of our loyalties, that we would not succumb to the sin of gossip. We pray, Father, that you would just cleanse us, that you would help us take every thought captive, that even our thought life would be more pleasing in your sight. Help us, Father, to be to put the most charitable construction on all that we encounter, that we too might be living examples of what you would have us be. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit to open that to our hearts and our lives. But above all, Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, our coming King, in whose name we commit ourselves. Amen.